Let us pray. Almighty God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be worthy in your sight. Amen. So when I was preparing for this message, I was cognizant of several things. The first is, the 4th of July is coming, making this a holiday weekend. The other thing, or one of the other things was, as you have learned in the last year, I am a massive history nerd. I know my history and use it a good bit. The third thing was some of the words that the Apostle Paul used when he was writing these words to the church in Rome. So when we start digging into these words, we start seeing the mentions to slavery and being slaves to sin. And in our world today, that's not something we would do. Mentioning slavery tends not to go well for us. We have a very negative view of slavery, as we should, and we still deal with the effects that that institution had on our nation. But Paul was specifically using an example that the people in Rome would know. Slavery was a common practice in the Roman Empire. It very different from the American way of doing it. And that's a whole other deep ball of wax that's better meant for a Bible study than a sermon. But he was using something that the people knew and understood to make his point about faith and what our faith in Christ does for us. So it's only fitting this week I try to do the same thing with something we tend to know very well. And that would be our own history, the events that surrounded that war for independence and our declaration of independence, something at some point in school we learned about it. And for the young ones who haven't yet, you will. But at a minimum, we all tend to know little bits and pieces, if not because some of those men are on our money. So we know who they are. But what's interesting is when we hear the ideas of freedom and liberty, when we hear of our independence, is it was also used in a different context at that time. One of the interesting parts of history that schools tend to gloss over because it's seen as more minor was actually the role of pastors at that time, specifically the Scotch-Irish Presbyterian ministers. These ministers, both the Presbyterians, also some Congregationalists up in New England, Lutheran pastors as well, not so much the Anglican for obvious reasons. They were raised in the First Great Awakening, George Whitfield, John Wesley, Gilbert Tennant, about, and they learned about freedom and liberty and how they are gifts from God that are extended to us by the grace of God things we still preach today. And throughout the revolution, they preached the same things, preaching freedom from slavery, kind of what we heard Paul say. And interestingly enough, their message was so effective, they earned a nickname from the British. They were called the Black Robed Regiment because they all preached in their black academic gowns and had a tremendous effect on the on the patriot morale and recruitment efforts. But the thing is, they weren't just preaching something political or philosophical. It really was a biblical message of freedom from slavery, because we heard it from the Apostle Paul. And the message still rang true then, as it does today, that there is a freedom that comes from our faith in Jesus Christ. That ultimate source of freedom, that freedom from slavery to sin, comes from Christ. There's a freedom that comes through faith. There's one little problem with that. When we start to discuss 
faith, we don't often think about what we gain. We often think about it in terms of what it costs. This is something that still sits in the back of my head from when I was about 14 years old. And there was kind of a cartoon in a mad magazine about the debate about school prayer, because in the late 90s, that was one of the great debates we were having. It comes up repeatedly. And in the cartoon, they showed a classroom. He had one kid there, crossed hands praying, and every, all the other kids were goofing off. And their commentary on it was, for every minute American students spend in prayer is one minute the Chinese gain on America. That's often how we view faith. We view it in terms of cost. But that's everything. There is always a cost to something. No matter what we pick, no matter what we do, there's a cost. Now, we could go down some deep rabbit holes on this, but I'm going to take something fairly common and benign. Think about being a sports fan. Any sport. Did you ever stop and think of the cost of being a fan? Because at a minimum, there's a cost in time. I mean, it takes time to watch a game or a match. And then if you spend time watching any, any of the commentary shows, well, that's more time and effort you put into it. On top of keeping track on transactions and injuries between teams, that all takes time. We haven't even gotten to the monetary costs. How much does it cost to go to a game? To get there, pay to park, pay for the ticket, pay for anything you get inside the stadium or arena, and then to get home? That's a financial cost, let alone any memorabilia that you would get or any apparel to wear. Then again, also think about how sometimes if you're a really rabid fan of a certain team, that that actually has some social effects as well. I mean, we could go online and you can see that there are little house flags and license plates that are made about home divided when the husband and wife are fans of two separate sports teams. Or if you're old enough, you could think back to the ESPN commercial in the early 2000s where you have a girl in an Ohio State shirt and a boy in a Michigan shirt, and they're on a couch kissing, and they just come up saying, if it weren't for sports, this wouldn't be disgusting. There is that societal effects of how rabid we are with a fan base and how it impacts relationships with other people. Of course, there's also the impact on yourself. Beyond the time, just the heartache, Potential for aggravation. Or if you're like me, you have to stop watching Saturday night games because then you're up till 2 a.m. because your heart gets racing by the time the game's over at midnight. And I'll say, as a pastor, that is horrible when you have an 845 church service and you can't get to sleep until 2. I just start reminding my mother, I work Sunday mornings. I can't stay up till midnight to watch a football game. Now that, now thinking about it, 1045 service, I can stay up a bit later. But there's a cost to it, isn't there? And the costs are about the same as it would be to come to church. Time, effort, money, all those things are still there. But oftentimes, we don't think of it in that way when it comes to other things. We see the benefit. And the truth is, we're always going to struggle with this. Because as we saw from Paul, we will always be a slave to something in this life. There's always going to be something that's going to draw our attention that wants us to give it everything we have. It's probably something about our fallen nature or human condition that just leads us to attaching onto something and giving everything to it, even if it gives us gray hairs and heartache. But what Paul's reminding that church in Rome is that that's what God wants from us. And it's not just about giving everything to God, but also what we get in return for it. As opposed to giving everything 
for me watching the Orioles and waiting for the intended heartbreak after decades of watching them lose. For the record, I'm excited because they haven't won the World Series since the year I was born. So I've been waiting literally my whole life for good years. But when we look at faith, I'm not going to get anything out of that, out of sports, but I do get something from Christ, from the time and effort that gets put into faith. And that's because Christ's atoning work on the cross paid the price, purchased us from slavery to sin and death to lead us to freedom in Him. Now, part of that, you're going to hear when we do the communion liturgy. That's part of it, the reminder that we are delivered from slavery to sin and death to new life. But that new life really is a freedom. This is what Paul reminded the Romans, and we see this in verses 13 and 14. Present yourself to God as those who have been brought from death to life, and present your members to God as instruments of righteousness. For sin will have no dominion over you, since you are not under law, but under grace. This is something that is important. Because this is a reminder of what we actually get. It's not about the cost, but the benefit that does come from faith, that the cost isn't lost. And in it, we're reminded that by grace, we are free from sin by the grace of God and can live as a free people. Thinking back to what we celebrate on Tuesday, freedom's kind of a big deal, being a free people. If you look back at what the Founding Fathers said and wrote, you get a lot of those words. Freedom from tyranny, from liberty. One of the other slogans that we probably all know is one that was, is still used today, especially if you go to D.C. and look at their license plates. No taxation without representation. You were taught that in school, right? That was one of the key rallying cries against the taxes the British Parliament put on the colonies by pointing out that the colonists had no represent, representatives there to speak for them. You know what's interesting with all of that? After the revolution, after all of that happened, the taxes that the government had to put on the colonists to pay for everything and to run everything were more than what the British Parliament had put on the colonists. They were paying more in taxes after the fact than they did before. And they would have under all the acts the British Parliament put in place. But think again about those four words. As wonderful as no taxation sounds, and I also say that knowing I just paid my quarterly taxes a couple weeks ago, so it sounds really good. It wasn't just a thing up against taxation. It was the second part, without representation. The idea that the people who are going to have to pay these taxes should have a voice in deciding what's going to get taxed and how it's going to get paid. Or, have, or select representatives to make those decisions for them. That was actually the underlying thing. It wasn't that they wanted the burden gone. It was they wanted their say. They wanted their choice. They wanted the freedom to choose how it was going to be. That's that reminder for us, because we think of freedom and faith that doesn't mean everything's perfect. There's still going to be struggles and challenges that are going to come up. but we have a freedom to choose how we deal with it, knowing that we have Christ as a source of our salvation, that we don't have to go towards death fearing it as an end, but as the next step to reunion. We don't have to worry about going through things alone. We have the Holy Spirit with us. We have the church and one another with us as we go through it. It's choosing having that freedom to choose to do it a different way, to do it God's way instead of the way of the world. 
That's that freedom that comes with that life in Christ. It's not being a slave to how things already are, but the freedom to choose to do it God's way and enjoy what will come because of it. Now, one of my favorite figures throughout the revolution was actually originally a pastor by the name of Peter Muhlenberg. Originally ordained as a Lutheran minister, he was also ordained in the Church of England so he could minister two congregations in rural Virginia, one German, one English. And there's a great dramatic scene about him preaching about time for war and time for peace and going off and leading his congregants in the revolution. But what's interesting with that is it wasn't forced. He presented that choice to the people who were there that day. They could choose to remain as they were, the language of the time being slaves to the tyrant, or could choose to seek freedom. And it's the same message that he would have preached about Christ. We have the choice to be slaves to sin and death, slaves to the world, or choose freedom that can only be found through our faith in Christ. What are you going to choose? Let us pray. Almighty God, we give you thanks for what you've done for us. For we are not bound by just how things always are. We're not bound to live as we're stuck in this world, but instead are able by your grace to choose you and your ways. Help us to see your ways, accept your grace, and to live as a free and redeemed people by our faith in Jesus Christ, so that we may always be working our way towards you as we live a life in Christ. Amen.